reading from the first a reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me thus: Gird your loins, stand up and tell them all that I command you. Be not crushed on their account, as though I were would leave you crushed before them. For it is I this day who have made you a fortified city, a pillar of iron, a wall of brass against the whole land, against Judah's kings and princes, against its priests and people. They will fight against you, but not prevail over you. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. I will sing your salvation. I will sing your salvation. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me and deliver me. Incline your ear to me and save me. I will sing your salvation. Be my rock of refuge, a stronghold to give me safety. For you are my rock and my fortress. O my God, rescue me from the hand of the wicked. For you are my hope, O Lord, my trust, O God, from my youth. On you I depend from birth. From my mother's womb, you are my strength. I will sing your salvation. My mouth shall declare your justice, day by day your salvation. O God, you have taught me from my youth. Until the present, I proclaim your wondrous deeds. I will sing your salvation. with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Herod was the one who had John the Baptist arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, whom he had married. John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias harbored a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but was unable to do so. Herod feared John, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man and kept him in custody. When he heard him speak, He was very much perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. She had an opportunity one day when Herod 
on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers, his military officers, and the leading men of Galilee. Herodias' own daughter came in and performed a dance that delighted Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, ask of me whatever you wish and I will grant it to you. He even swore many things to her, I will grant you whatever you ask of me, even to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptist. The king was deeply distressed. The girl hurried back to the king's presence and made her request, I want you to give me at once on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was deeply distressed, but because of his oaths and the guests, he did not wish to break his word to her, so he promptly dispatched an executioner with orders to bring back his head. He went off and beheaded him in the prison. He brought in the head on a platter and gave it to the girl. The girl, in turn, gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. St. John the Baptist figures largely in the New Testament. The church places him among the most venerated of saints. We celebrate his birthday and the day of his heavenly birthday, his dies natalis. 24 June observes the solemnity of his birth. As one author writes, the birth of Jesus is observed on December 25th at the time of the winter solstice, while the birth of his forerunner is observed six months earlier at the time of the summer solstice. That's a book called The Church's Year of Grace by a Benedictine author who's deceased now, Father Pius Pasch. Christ enters our world in bleak winter. He, the light of the world, possesses the power to illuminate our planet. John arrives among us while the sun blazes fulsomely. He, the forerunner, is destined in God's plan to announce that the true light is coming into the world. Earlier, while John was still within the womb of his mother, our lady's cousin, St. Elizabeth, he leapt for joy. This sign from the quickened John the Baptist came when our blessed lady, Mary of the Visitation, while pregnant with the Lord, embraced Elizabeth. So St. John the Baptist affords the first witness to the wonderful truth that Jesus and Mary are active in our world. He announces before he can speak that the Holy One is among us. He signals the purpose of the incarnation. In Christ, God wishes to save all people. Only Christian salvation brings true joy. So John leaps in the womb of his mother for joy. John the Baptist's mature actions prepared those who encountered him to receive Christ, the Lamb of God. Images of St. John the Baptist always show him attired in his camel hair covering and with other accompanying signs of austerity. He ate locusts and wild honey. He preferred isolated places without the signs of civilization. He also challenged those who departed gravely from God's law. 
It is not lawful for you, proclaimed John, to have your brother's wife. And this wife, Herodias, harbored a grudge against John. Then played out the events that we hear in today's gospel. John suffers his passion, his beheading, to satisfy the lusts of a corrupt court. What lessons can we learn from St. John the Baptist's life and martyrdom? First, sin never trumps the divine plan. Herod surely thought he had put an end to the Baptist. Today's feast, indeed both feasts, clearly indicate that poor Herod was mistaken. The triumph goes to John the Baptist, among the most venerated of saints. In Latin countries, I'm told, one still finds many sons baptized John the Baptist. One sign of the importance that the Christian faith holds for so many throughout the world. This same divine grace remains active in the church today. Adversity and confusion can never thwart the design of God's goodness. Indeed, sin can never claim the final victory. Sinners may leave themselves liable to punishment. The Catholic faith requires us to believe that in the end, the victory belongs to Christ, the true light who has come into the world. Secondly, St. John the Baptist shows us that God uses sacramental signs to make known the wonders of his power and grace. When John leapt in his mother's womb, he gave the world a visible sign of invisible grace. And during his blessed lifetime, Christ would give new definition to the sacramental structure. He institutes seven sacraments of salvation. Each of them offer visible signs of invisible grace, the Eucharist here, being, of course, uh, one of the most obvious. Each of the sacraments enacts, through the ministry of priests, a saving mystery for the worthy recipient. Some schools of theology, sadly, have neglected the efficacy of the sacramental actions and have replaced this essential definition with various accounts of symbolism. One may easily and wrongly conclude that the sacraments work in our heads instead of through their own efficacy. John the Baptist should remind us that God's sacraments communicate sa saving grace even when they are administered by unworthy ministers. Herod's ax man does not keep us from celebrating the passion of John the Baptist. The third lesson that comes from today's feast stands out as the most obvious. Christ's instruments of redemption suffer opposition. Jesus never said, they're all gonna like you. John the Baptist stands out as the man who first announces the joy of redemption and also the first to witness to that joy with his life. Today we can expect no less. We honor martyrs because we embrace the king of martyrs. And after the turmoil, new life returns. What is even better, throughout the turmoil, faithful Catholics know that the divine love remains active in the lives of those whose faith is not shaken. They also know that the sacraments of the church, including the forgiveness of sins, communicates God's power even when, may God forbid, an unworthy minister speaks the absolution. 